So again, good afternoon. Welcome to the 3 p.m. service. I'm Francis. I'm one of the campus missionaries, not a pastor, just a campus missionary, serving here in Victory Las Piñas. So before I start, before we dive into the Word, um, as I've said, I've, I'm a campus missionary, and one of the things that I get to do, like one of the things that I get to um, take part in is that to update the church on what God is doing on campus, like how He's reaching out to the students, how He expresses His love. So one of the things that we did was this, an update, Love Month. We had a love month last month. It's February. We know the concept of it. People giving love to each other, not just in the context of rom uh, romance, but also of how families express that. So what we had um, last month was we did a campus outreach activity in the campuses of Las Piñas National High School, Almanza, and uh, Bethany, CELP, that's somewhere around in the area of Pilar. Another area is in Perps in Las Piñas City National Science High School. You just have to take a breath. <laughs> That's a lot of names. But what we did there is that we gave some um, chocolates, sweets to the, some of the students. Some of them have that. Um, we attached a note there expressing God's love for them. Um, but more than anything else, I think one of the highlights that we had is that aside from us, sharing the love of God to the students, um, doing outreach and preaching the gospel to them, is that we have campus volunteers who went with us. Just like the video that we saw earlier, like it's a multi-generational thing. It's a whole church community doing campus ministry when we saw that. So some of the volunteers that we have was that some of them were students, um, studying from Adamson, who's taking a portion of her time. She did all her part. They did, they studied, they, all of the duties of a student, but still making time, sharing the word of God to the students, leading victory groups there. Not only that, we, there are some internationals who went out of their way, out of their comfort zone to um, share the word of God to some of the locals that we have um, in Perpetual. And not only that, we also have parents, uh, married people also comes with us, along with their little kid. We have a little campus missionary. Um, she's one of the daughters of our volunteers here also in church. So I just want to take this time to just thank you. Um, whether you're supporting through giving or going with us on campus, we want to thank you because even if you're just going or by giving, you don't know how, even with the little thing that you're doing, it already impacts a generation. It's your faith in God that is being evident through those acts of faith that will make a big impact in the life of a student. So not only that, um, also we want to thank you for some of the parents who allowed their children to come with us to do campus outreach. I'm not sure if they're here um, at the Trinity and Cuyabino, but we also have some of the parents as well who would really encourage and push their children to join in how to do outreach. Another update would be Victory Weekend. Who among you here were in Victory Weekend? There you are. You see, we have a special side over here. Some of them were participants from yesterday. So yesterday, we ended the two-day retreat. Um, and one thing about that is we get to see a very diverse and multi-generational group of people who decided to take that step of faith further and grow more in their faith in God, meaning deeper faith. And later, we'll see and we'll witness and we'll get to celebrate with them as they declare their faith in Jesus publicly through water baptism. And I'm excited for that after the service. So, moving on to the, to the series we've been... Um, having this series called Faith Like No Other. And for the past two weeks, we've been amazed how God uses people with even with a faith like, as small as a mustard seed to do great things for His honor and glory. During the first week, we saw how God um, commanded Noah to do and build the ship. Imagine, for Pastor Rain mentioned that, 120 years I just can't imagine for a person to build a ship like that with no power tools, without anything, with just bare hands. But I do believe that God, that the reason why He has faith 
a faith like no other because God was the one who sustained him with strength for 120 years, provision, materials for 120 years so that he would be able to accomplish what God has called him to do. And on the second week, we saw the faith of Jonathan in his armor bearer. Imagine just the two of them attacking a camp. I just can't imagine that, that scenario where they attack the camp and there's a, a multitude. I'm not, I forgot if it's thousands or hundreds of people there on the other side, but imagine it's just the two of them and their faith declaration that God can save by many or by few. Aren't you blessed that we have a God who is faithful and true? That we have a God that despite of our limitations, He continues to sustain our faith so that we can have a faith like no other. Then just like what we're going to be talking about today through the life of Elijah. But before anything else, I want to ask you this question. How do you feel about this photo every time that you see this on your phones, on your gadgets? But there's a lot of emotion. I hear a lot of commotion. <laughs> Natataranta, nagiging anxious. Uy, tatawag na si ganito. <laughs> and isn't it that we go great lengths just to stay charged. Like for example, we always make sure when we ever we go to the coffee shops to do work, to study, or even just hang out, we make sure that there's always a power outlet. And there are times, pupunta ka sa barista, magtatanong, pwede mo charge. <laughs> Not only that, we have power banks, and even to that extent of asking a person whom you do not know, you're not, aware, you're not um, that person is a stranger to you. But because you have a need, you need to be charged. And you're going to approach that person, tell that person, Kuya, ate, okay lang po ba? Pwede po charge And use his or her power bank. There's, there's this always feeling of us wanting to be full charged. Even when it comes to our faith, that we have this tendency or thought that for us to have a faith like no other, we need to be full charge always. There's always a certain kind of scenario or event or a situation where we need to have that kind of um, faith that we're always 100% for us to do great things for God. But how about those moments that when our faith is drained? What do we do? How do we go about it? The better question yet is that when those moments that when our faith is drained and there's nothing else, what does God do in our midst, on our behalf? So we're going to be looking at um, 1 Kings chapter 19. I think it's going to be the whole verse, but I'll be reading as, we, um, as I invite you to stand up in reverence of God's Word. We'll be reading from, chap uh, from verse 1. Verses 1 to 8, it says there, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the, one, as the life of one of them by, the, by this time tomorrow, meaning killing him. Then he was afraid. He arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. In verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb or Mount Sinai, the Mount of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We're grateful, Lord God, that through your word, Lord, you will nourish us. You said, Lord, that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that you have breathed. 
So Lord, that's our prayer. Would you breathe in your word to each and every one of us, your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you fill this place and anoint the preaching of your word this afternoon and bring nourishment to our souls and to our bodies. God, we praise you, we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, you can all sit down. So this story is just a follow-up of what happened after a great showdown. I think we have this. Um, this is not a fire bender bending fire. Just a disclaimer if you're aware or familiar with the show. But it's after the showdown of the prophet Elijah challenging 450 prophets of Baal. Meaning, during this time, Israel was divided into two, the northern and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was really deep into their idolatry. Like, the culture has been set place. There have been, um, it's not just Baal, but there were Asherah poles during this time. And God was doing something in the midst of this. The showdown was meant to show who God, who is the real God. So what happened during this time when he challenged or he dared the 450 um, prophets is that through King Ahab, he invited the 450 to Mar in Mount Carmel and he dared that set up an altar, bring two bulls as an offering and whoever would bring down fire without any intervention from a human being, like, like in a snap, that is a real God. And lo and behold, uh, the story would follow after is that God sent down fire and God became triumphant during the story through the prophet Elijah. And the, pro the prophets of Baal were killed because they were following, a not, uh, they were follow following an idol during this time. And another thing about the prophet is that Elijah's story, as recorded in the chapters before this, 17 and 18, we see a man of faith. A man of God would always have a confidence every time that God would um, speak to him. Not only that he's a man of faith, but he also is a man who does things miraculously through the power and might of God. He multiplied the food supply of the widow in Zarephath. And not only that, that he raised her son to life when her son became ill and died. But the question is, how come this guy, a person who is a prophet, a person who would ask God boldly for greater things to happen, suddenly become fearful. Especially when King Ahab went to his wife, Queen Jezebel, and told everything that had happened. The mighty exploits. And when Queen Jezebel heard this, he threatened. He threatened the, the prophet Elijah. He said that I would also do what you have done to my prophets, that I would kill you by tomorrow. Imagine, may tanika for 24 hours. You only had 24 hours to live. And just to take note, the reality of that fear is real because Queen Jezebel is like no other queen that she had the history of killing the prophets of God. And this is why there's so much fear in the life of Elijah. The prophet feared for his life. And because of this fear, it made him do a lot of things. Four things when we talk about the fear or the effects of fear in the life of Elijah. First is that fear made him run for his life. Which is valid. I mean, you're about to be killed and you're not going to run away. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Another thing that fear did to him, fear brought him into isolation. He was fearful. Probably was thinking, I don't want, to have, I don't want my servant to be killed, I guess. I can't take the emotions, the the stress of the threat. This is why he went alone to the wilderness, traveling all day. He, le he left his servant somewhere. Another thing that fear 
did to him is that fear made him quit. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Wow. The gravity of that pain, the gravity of that emotion. It's like being depressed because of this certain stress. Take away my life. It is enough. God, I can take it. And lastly is that it fear made him question his worth. That I am no better than my father's. He thought that he was a failure. Everything that he had done for the Lord, the mighty acts, were in vain. And it's how fear play with us, right? Made us, it makes us quit. It makes us question our worth and value. It makes us run away. It makes us isolated. Fearful, hopeless, in despair. In despair. This was the mental and emotional state of the prophet. And many of us here somehow have heard this kind of, um, what do you call this, lines. Or even us ourselves, we said this to ourselves. That you tried your best, you did your part, but things didn't end up the way you expect it to be. Not only that, you had the strong resolve of doing what is right, upholding integrity at the beginning. But because of the pressure, you don't know what to do anymore. You didn't cheat in your exams, but still failed. You're still waiting for God's perfect timing for the singles. You're, God, you're still waiting for God's perfect timing. But there is so much pressure because the people around you are already getting married. You didn't compromise in your business, but you're not gaining any profits. You've been praying for a relational restoration in your family, but there is rift, but the rift is getting worse. And you've been faithful in generosity, giving, supporting what needs to be supported, like canceling out the debt of a friend. But why is it that the expenses are piling up? The fear that we feel from these situations are really valid. We experience it, that emotion. But you see, the enemy uses this emotion to instill something in their heart so that we will be paralyzed and we won't realize what God has in store for us. Yet, here's the good news. The comforting truth is that even when faith feels out of reach or completely absent, that there is a God whose faithfulness to us remains unwavering and unparalleled. Come on, you give God praise for that. That even in our unfaithfulness, even in our faithlessness, God will always remain faithful. His steadfast love endures forever, for eternity. And that is how good and faithful God is to each and every one of us. And the good thing is that God is not hindered by our fears from moving in our lives. He's not. He's not intimidated. Yes, we feel that fear. You messed up. You don't know what's going to happen. But even in our mess, God can still turn things around and use it for His purpose and glory. That He can all still make blessings out of nothing. And that's what we can see from the life of Elijah. In the succeeding verses, it says there, he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked, and, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and laid, lay down again. What we can see here is that we have a God who's not just concerned with what we can do and what we can give, but we have a God who is also concerned of our welfare. That when there is no faith in you, when you can't do anything, even take a step of faith, God is there to restore, to sustain you, to give rest to each and every one of us. Can you see what I'm grateful about this part is that, imagine it was just two days of provision, of food and rest, 
and it strengthened him for 40 days and 40 nights of travel going to Mount Horeb. I just can't imagine how many vitamins, nutrition, God placed when he was baking the bread in water. Para siyang, ano po, para siyang uh, vitamin drip. It's like a drip. They imagine God sustained him during the journey. And during this time, there was still no faith. He was still in that emotional state. But there was God. Let me say that again. Even if there's nothing, there's still God. God is there on His behalf, in His midst, sustaining Him, providing food and providing rest. And let me talk about rest for a while. For some of us, we have this mindset, or at least the world has taught us that when we talk about rest, it has to be earned. You have to finish six days of work or five days of work and rest on Saturday, Sunday. You have to complete your project so that you can take a VL and finish your work. Sometimes during the VL, we dala pa natin dahil uso na rin yung workation. But you see, work should not be earned because it is the grace of God in us, to us. Rest is a gift that God has given to humanity. It is not earned but he, because He gives it to each and every one of us. That even in our times like this, when you're too tired even just to get out of bed, rest can still be made available because rest has been given to us. So like if you're feeling tired, sometimes our body says it already and that it's as if God is saying, my child rest. My child eat. I know there would be moments and instances that it's hard to eat. It's hard to sleep. But the Bible says also that God is a giver of sleep. It, that sleep is a gift from God. Take hold on who God is in our lives, especially in these moments. And I just can hear God saying to us right now, My child, I know that the work is big. I know that you are a mighty man, a, a mighty woman of faith, that you've been rallying my kingdom in your workplace, in your family. You've been holding on to integrity. And there's so much to be accomplished. But my child, you have to remember that I see you not as a servant or a slave, rather, but I see you as my son and a daughter. So rest, my child. Practically speaking, when it's time to eat, as I've said earlier, we have to do this. We need to take a pause. Why? Just like what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, that don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries and today's trouble is enough for today. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you slept? As in that eight-hour sleep. When was the last time that you enjoyed eating? When was it? I remember when we were still um, raising, when we were, Ethan was still small, um, it feels like sleep is a luxury for us because we have to wake up early in the wee hours of the morning. We have to feed him every three hours here and there. But one thing that I've realized, even in those um, hectic schedules that we had during the pandemic, is that God was still there. God is faithful. That we were able to rest. We, will, we were able to sleep. God provided for us when we thought that money will be an issue. Because imagine it's not easy to um, deliver a baby during the pandemic because all of the fees were high. Like the amount, expenses doubled. Like for a deliv uh, normal delivery, normally pre-pandemic, 
times it was just around 50,000. During the pandemic, it doubled at around 100. So imagine how much more a CS would cost. But imagine God faithfully provided. And I, it's not just our story. I firmly believe that you who are seated there, you have a testimony from God that even in your lowest point, He provided, He sustained. The beautiful thing about God is not just He's providing our physical wear for our physical welfare, but He is also thinking for our mental. Because when Elijah arrived at Mount Horeb, he, came, he went inside to a cave. He had an encounter with God there. There was a conversation. In verse 19, it says there, What are you doing here? Elijah, God asked. You have to take note that every time that God would ask a what or a why, it's not that God doesn't know. It's not that He's not aware. But more so that He's drawing something out of us so that we can be more honest with Him, so that he, we can know that He is able to handle our emotions. That these are open opportunities where we can be, where we can converse with God, where we can be intimate with Him, even in our deepest pains and hurts. And it's proven beneficial. Who among you here can? Uh, do you have a psycholo uh, psychology background? That I'm <laughs> there. We have a psychology student here in front. Um, isn't it true that it's proven beneficial that when you process your thoughts and your emotions, it eases up the pain from the inside mentally as well? And this is what's happening here. In verse 10, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take away, to take it away. God is saying, God, I did, Elijah is saying to God, God, I've done my part. I've been passionate about the things of your work. I've been advancing your kingdom. But why is it there is no revival in the things that I'm doing? Even to the point of threatening, Lord, they would take away my job. They would, Lord, kick me out of school. They would do this to me. Even, Lord, reject me as part of the family. And this is Elijah being just open to the Lord. And for some of us, being open is... Kind of an issue, probably because we think like people might not understand what we're feeling and we might be judged in the process when we share. Or probably there's a lie that um, maybe he, that person, even if that's your friend, maybe that my friend can't handle what I'm um, going through. I might add another burden to him or her. But with God, he can handle even our raw emotions. And when you look into the Bible, many people have been open to God. David, just like um, Danny a while ago, and he was telling how he lamented before God. It was written in Psalms. And there was even a book full of lamentations, named Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah. My point here is this. God can handle our emotions he is not scared when you tell him your deepest thoughts and pain. My question for you is, when was the last time you were open to God and just have been honest with him, with what you're feeling? Then this is what we call pouring out to the Lord. When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you spent time, God, I don't know what to do. Even Peter, when he was think, sinking and there were no words for him to say, Lord, all of it was just, Lord, save me. Because that was just really the two words. He was still being open. When was the last time you did that with God? You poured out. This is why we have an encouragement from 1 Peter 5, 7, that casting all our anxieties, all, not just some, but all anxieties, worries, concerns, once and for all, on whom? On Him because He can carry. He is capable. He is able to handle it. Because we have a powerful God. For He cares about who? 
cares about you, cares about us. And during this moment, moving forward, is that Elijah and his emotions only saw the end. And sometimes we're like that. In our emotional state, we can only see the end of it. That like, God, this is a dead end for me. I have nothing to give. Would you just take my life? Lord, would you just take everything? But you know what? God knew that there's more. When we see a dead end, God sees an opportunity. When we see that we're already at the end of things, God is just making or orchestrating things to start something new in our lives. So this is why he had to do something in the faith of Elijah. He had to do a faith CPR. He had to revive, some, to revive something in him. And how did he do that? So God instructed Elijah to stand on the mount before him. So what happened there is that the Lord passed by in a great strong wind toward the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind there. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. The mastering of elements, the bending. <laughs> As how we know it nowadays. God has been using those moments, even in the past, even in the Old Testament, to show His might, to show who He is. Even in Psalms 29, 3, 4, when we talk about God's voice, it's like this, that the voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. And the voice of the Lord is powerful. The vo voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Elijah was already familiar with it, how God speaks. It speaks with power. It speaks with majesty that even the earth quakes. But why is it? God's voice was not there. What is God doing? And sometimes God is like that to us. We've been so familiar with things that it's hard for us to recognize His voice. This is why He would use another aspect, another way of speaking to us. If God was not in the fire, if God was not in the earthquake, if God is not in the wind, where is God? That is the question here. God revealed to him in a gentle whisper. Let me say that again. God revealed, to him, revealed himself to Elijah in a gentle whisper. After the fire, the sound of a low whisper happened. We see two things here. Yes, God is mighty. God is powerful, God is majestic, but at the same time, God is gentle and God is near. For a whisper to be heard, it should not come from a distance. Of course, because you can hear a whisper from afar, right? For a whisper to be heard, there should be a close, what? Proximity. And this is God telling Elijah, I'm not in the wind, I'm not in the fire. I'm not in the earthquake. Elijah, I am with you, near you. Many times, our encounters with God, we have boxed Him because we're used to like conferences, um, worship nights, which are good. I grew up attending a lot of youth camps. I've, I've encountered God there. But you see, for us to encounter God, we can encounter Him even in the mundane, when you brush your teeth, when you ride the Jeep, when you're in just in your room, you can encounter God. That you don't have to wait once a week or once a month for an encounter because even in the daily things that you're doing, you can encounter Him. But the question is, do you give time? Do you allot time? Because for Elijah to hear God, he had to what? Make time by traveling for 40 days and 40 nights for this. It's not that we are highlighting the effort of Elijah, 
But what we're saying that our participation for us to hear God in the midst of the daily things is that we need to make time with Him. This is why daily devotion is the discipline, the spiritual disciplines are important. It's not that we check out a list of obligations or duties. That's religion. But what God wants from us is to have an intimate and personal relationship with Him. I remember yesterday when Pastor Ray was teaching about faith. For faith to happen, you have to understand and know who the object of faith is. Because it's hard to have faith in God if we don't know Him. It's hard to have faith in God if our understanding and knowledge of Him is just a second-hand knowledge. I heard that from another person. Probably I might be blessed. But for us to be able to have faith and for that faith to be built, we need to hear God personally, closely, intimately, in the gentle whisper. If God speaks here in our services, God can also speak in your quiet times. And what happened after? Elijah re responded in an act of faith, a small step of faith. When he heard the gentle whisper of God, he went out of the cave and he wrapped him, his face in his cloak and stood at that entrance. He covered his face, not because of shame. He did this because it's his worship. He just knew that the presence of God was there. It was an act of humility. If God has been speaking to us all along, have you been responding? Have been you lending an ear? Humility. To just look, go out of that cave and be present at that moment. God, I'm here. God, I want to hear you. Because that was what was happening. And the starting point of our faith is when we get to recognize the divine in our lives and our need of Him. Verses 14 and 18, after that, God asked Elijah, Again, what is he doing? The same thought of line. God asked, what are you doing? Elijah said again, Lord, I'm the only one. God, I've been passionate. God, they want me to be killed. Did you see? What's very odd here in this part is that God responded in a different manner. Normally for us, we want to be comforted, right? God, I know my son. I see you. I love you. Pat in the back. But what God did here is that he gave a command. Probably you're thinking, is God insensitive to what I am feeling, what I'm going through? Why would he want, why would he command something out of me? But I think it was God's insens insensitivity to us or to the prophet. But it's just that God wants Elijah to realize that there is more to his case. Yes, you're there. Yes, you're in that situation. But that doesn't mean that you can't do these things. That you are not defined by your lowliness. That you're not defined by your situation. Because I am your God, the Lord says. And for us here, I don't know where you have, where you have been in your, in your walk with God. Maybe you've encountered the breakup in the family in your friendship. Maybe you failed an exam. Maybe you've been pressuring yourself because you're studying in a science high school. But just because your situation is like that, your destiny would be like that as well. It's not the case. We always hear this. For I know the plans that I have for you, the Lord says, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope in the future. And that is God speaking destiny in the midst of our hardships. And in the same way, God speaking destiny, reigniting the calling of Elijah in his life. Because you see, Elijah responded here. God sustained him with what? And restored his faith. 
sustain him in the physical, sustain him in the mental. In here, God is sustaining him in the spiritual as well, restoring something inside of him. And because of God's provision and sustenance in his life, Elijah responded. He departed. He went out in faith. He did what, what, what God told him to do, to take Jehu, to anoint his king, to go to Elisha. And you know, towards the end of the story is that further verses, God reassured, God gave a word. In, if at the beginning, fe uh, fear through the word of Jezebel broke Elijah, it was the word of God at the end of the story that reassured Elijah also. He restored. Why? What did he tell? Because he, remember, Elijah was telling God, God, I'm not, I'm the only one here. There's no one left. I'm the only faithful person in this place at this time. But all along, Elijah didn't know that God set aside 7,000 who are faithful, who loves God. So he got reignited his faith with the word of reassured that, Elijah, you're not alone. The things that you've been doing in the past were not in vain. And you know, I thank God that he responded in a faith like no other when he went out without question. Because imagine, when he went out after this, he did what? Anointed, did what God told him to do, and even he anointed Elisha as the next in line for him. And when he did that, on record, Elisha did twice as much as Elijah compared to Elijah. Can I challenge you this afternoon? Just imagine this with me. What if you don't give up on God and His call for you? The things that He want, wants you to do in your family, in your workplace, the calling of God in your life, to hold on to it, even if the going gets tough? What if you pressed on and endure? What if your faith is just as small as a mustard seed? The reason why I'm challenging that thought is because of this. Our obedience and faith to God, no matter how small, can echo not just in our lifetime, but in the generations after us. And this is what why it's very important that we hold on because it's not just your situation, it's not just your fate, but it impacts the children after us. We see the, ch we see the next generation here in this room. There's a lot of them, students, high schoolers, college, and even in the elementary, even in kids' church. Your faith now when you stood, when you endured, these are stories that will be passed on to them and they will hold on to it. Nowadays, there's, there's a statistics in the U.S. or in the Western part of the world that there's a lot of young people nowadays exiting church. A lot of people not even knowing church. I can't judge what happened to the generations before them or what they have done or what they did not do. But it's only a reminder for us that our faith now impacts the next generation as well. It's not just for Elijah, but it was also for Elijah to be passed on to. As I end, this is the reason why we can press on. This is the reason why we can endure. This is the reason why we can stand firm. Because to have a faith like no other, we need to remember that God remains faithful to support us when our faith is depleted and faithful to replenish us when our faith is lacking. Can we give God a praise for that? Before we take this time to worship, I just want to take this time to just pray for each and every one of you. 
probably you're here, you just, you've been invited by a friend, probably getting something, something that would be reignited in your heart, or you've been at the end of your journey and you don't know what to do anymore, or you've been waiting for a promise for, gen for decades already, Lord, when is it gonna happen? When is it gonna come? And you've been, Lord, um, I don't know. Maybe you're here. You're a student and you've been using the catch-up Fridays to catch up on sleep, to catch up on rest. Because you know that you've been tired already. It's been tiring. If you're that person, 1 Peter 5.10 says there, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that even at times, Lord, that we feel that we are hopeless in this, and in despair, that God, you are there. That you are true to your word, that you will never leave us or forsake us. God, we thank you that, Lord, that we don't feel that we are judged just because we feel this way. We go through these things. But because we, you are understanding, gentle, and near, we are also encouraged, Lord God, by that. And we are sustained. God, I pray, Lord, you said in your word in Isaiah that those who trust in you, that their strength will be renewed. That God, for those people that have been fighting, who have been, Lord, going through life, that God, that they've been, Lord, Lord, when? That's the question. Sometimes it's why. And they don't find reason for these things. God, I pray that would you give them the grace to look at you, to fix their eyes upon you, who is the author and perfecter of your faith. That God, in everything, even if the answer is not now, Lord, that God, you yourself will be enough. And that God, remind them as well that you are the God of miracles. That you're not just written in a book, but Lord, you are living and active, God. That God, as ourselves, we can encounter you personally, just like Elijah did. And God, that's our prayer. Lord, would you reignite that again, that faith. God, thank you. There's hope, there's peace, there's joy being in your presence because we have a faithful and good God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.